We've somehow managed to get every freak on this podcast, and now they've taken it over. Could have prevented this if you'd gone to patreon.com slash evac station. For less than the cost of my daughter's birthday present, you can support our show and allow us to pay for posting services and such. Again, that's patreon.com slash evac station. Now, time for takeoff. Taking control of this plane, and now you're going to listen to us, uh, listen to this podcast, or we'll take you out, and you don't get a parachute. This is the After Credits cast. I am Cam Aaron Poseska. God, it's horrible. I don't have just bad puns, though. <laughs> I have two co-hosts with me, and they are Ryan Diamond Dog Metters. <laughs> and, uh, of course, with me today, I've got, uh, I went with two different ideas for this one, so you can correct me whichever one you want, uh, Bo. I got Billy Bolum, or... But we catch him. Bow him up all day, man. Oh, he's the best sidekick character. Oh, I love that guy. Yeah, that's I'm a proud that's a proud parody, my friend. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so welcome to the after credits cast where we will be talking about uh, some movies here in a minute. Before we get to that though, let's get some stuff out of the way real quick, some uh, housekeeping. You can go to Patreon, YouTube, Peepa, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or tune in to listen to our podcast as well as Podcast Addict. You can also find us on tw- Twitter, Tumblr, or Facebook. And we also have an email. Ryan, what is that email? That email is, why didn't you put the bunny back in the box? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Sorry. That email is evacstation at gmail.com. Indeed. Um, so uh, we'll start off with every episode with a little bit of what you're watching. So, gentlemen. What have you been watching this past week, aside from the stuff we've been doing here? We haven't heard from you in a minute. What are you? What are you up to? Oh, you know, uh, I've been really busy. Uh, opened up a food truck. If uh, any of you guys follow me on the Facebooks and all the socials, so I've been pretty preoccupied with that. But I've been uh, blasting through Community. Um, <sighs> went home late at night. Like I've been going to my go-to. And I got to say, this show holds up so amazingly well. Like, if you haven't watched it, please go watch it. Uh, if you've watched it, please go watch it again. Because um, just with the end game coming and with... Uh, All know, those Anthony, cameos. Well, you got Anthony and Joe Russo who, like, uh, I don't want to get distracted here, but they've just directed a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. And wasn't for the influence they had for tying timelines and storylines together through rest of development, through a community, like they couldn't have produced produce or made uh, end game. So I've been going through the community, just got to check them out out and just uh, kind of just relishing in uh, Anthony and Joe Rustel's uh, past works. Yeah. I actually tried to get my fiance in the community a little while, a little ways back. I showed her uh, the D and D episode, which is like their best episode. And the, uh, which episode was it? It was the, uh, oh, the timeline episode where they make the alternate timelines with that pizza delivery thing. That was fun, too. Mm. That was pretty conceptual, though. I I could see where you could, like, why you would want to intro that episode to your, like, uh, fiancé, like, future wife. You're like, girl, if you ain't going to get it, you're not going to get it at all. So please, (laughs) like, our future depicts on this. Uh, If you understand this show... It's either I'm leaving you at the altar or we're getting married for the rest of our lives. So, girl, please love this show. <laughs> I don't think she was super... That's how in- I feel. I don't think she was super into it, but I don't think she hated it. I think it, I think I have to show her, like, other episodes that are, like, also, like, a little more... It's a pretty intense episode to get inter- introduced oh, yeah, yeah. to, so... Yeah. De- definitely, like, can... definitely gotta go back to, like, season one or something and roll her into that, like, the paintball episode. Those are also good. Oh, they're so good. I love a bed when he is, uh... When he like acts like a romantic type like when he's Han Solo or acted like Don Draper from Mad Men like he just like switches out of these characters so well and he's extremely charming in these roles like well that I one episode where he went like full Nick Cage <laughs> oh man oh, trust me I got notes like I'm very excited about this next series boys I'm excited too uh, oh Letter Kenny 
if you're not watching Letter Kenny, you suck ass. Go out and watch that show too. <laughs> uh, Ryan, what have you been watching? Well, uh, speaking of girlfriends, uh, my girlfriend got me into. Well, she she re- she formally requested that we watch this show, and I was very hesitant because it's really not my bag. But I did it for her <laughs> because she loves horror, despite the fact that it scares the shit out of her. And she had already seen it, so I said, "Well." Aaron will love this. <laughs> I sat down and watched all of Haunting at Hill House. Yes. Ooh, yes. Nice. Holy shit. <laughs> okay, Ryan. We don't have a lot of time, but give me the deets. What would you like? It you was, like? Okay. I, I mean, the whole thing was fantastic. And I found myself getting really, really pissed off at the beginning that the show was so well made because I was getting so scared and I wanted to just be like, nah, I'm done, fuck it. But it kept pulling me with how well made it was and how well crafted the family's story was. It's like at the heart of all this paranormal bullshit, you have a really compelling story about these five kids who went through nonsense and like how it's affecting them as adults. And I'm like, Shit, I'm invested. No. <laughs> Damn it. I knew he it. Was our ghost. God I knew you'd love it. it. I knew you'd love it. <laughs> it was it was really good. I mean, I mean the the ending had me stunned. I like we could do a whole damn like episode on Haunting on Hill House. Suffice it to say, I I think it's wonderful. Why they're doing a second season, I have no fucking clue. If but it's a I different family it. or a different point in the house's history, I'm down, but if it's the same family, I'm out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll keep mine quick, and I mean that quite literally. Uh, I watched. I got, uh, I got two short things for my for my what you watching. One of which is uh, Amanda and I are getting to the Flash. Um, I've seen the whole series uh, for at least the first three seasons, but she has not. And since we just finished Supergirl not too, too long ago, that was gonna be our next pick. And uh, nice, yeah, nice. It, it's been good so far. Good stuff. Um, it's a good show. I need to go back to it. I just, I haven't had the time. Oh, yeah. Um, we're just at the point now where Spivet and ba- Barry are dating. So, yeah, that's good stuff. Spoilers. Um, it's season two. It's fine. It's <laughs> JK. Uh, and then, uh, suit related to that, I saw the Sonic the Hedgehog trailer. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. It has human teeth. Sonic the this- it's 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 not great. So creepy. <laughs> it's kind of bad. Oh, it's so creepy. Uh, I I had to bring it up though because I mean, like I said, it was it, it's, it's a quick little update. Uh, they're redesigning it though, so I'm excited to see what they do with that. I feel bad for the digital artists who have to do it though, because that's a lot of fucking crunch yeah. time, and they that's don't deserve good. that. They don't deserve that. Speaking of things, if only their direction had told them to make it better at like from jump. If only, the, if, if only their uh, their pu- uh, publishing company, uh, who is it now? It's uh, is it Warner Brothers? Oh wait, no, Sony. It's Sony. If only Sony's uh, CEO's had looked at this and said, "No, you can't do this. This is bad." Well, there's a huge market for it. That's something we haven't really tapped into. Is where you know, as we see Marvel like evolve into, because we've seen a lot of like not great Marvel movies. And it took a lot of stumbling, like, you take Fantastic Four, you know, back in the day, blah, blah, blah. You know, like, there's been a real evolution with the Marvel Universe as far as the movies go. And so I'm really curious to see is, like, if there's a taper off point of the Marvel Universe, is it we kind of, like, move on to see if there's going to be an effort and a budget put into video game crossovers. I think it's possible. But, and I think we're going to see it very soon if we haven't already, because uh, by the time we this comes out, Detective Pikachu have released, I'm excited to see how that does, because everything about that looks like it's doing much better. Yeah, you think so? <laughs> I mean, visually, it's gotten a lot more positive response, and I think that the brand name and all that stuff alone will be enough to get it quite a good chunk of change. I don't think it'll be the top box office movie of the year, by any means, right. but it'll definitely be in top ten, I imagine. I think there's definitely be a cult following with it, but someone for me who's a little bit outside the culture of uh, Pokemon, um, like I'm a little bit confused. Like Detective Pikachu, 
like I you know was, I, I have a very like broad you know education on uh, Pokemon so I'm, what is Detective Pikachu? Um, I'm not super familiar with it, but it's a spinoff game in which uh, you play a detective and his partner who is a talking Pikachu, but I've not played the game, so I don't know exactly why he can talk, and I assume that that would right. be a spoiler for the movie, so I wouldn't get into it even if I did know. I don't want to go too far. But So uh, do you think they chose a storyline that's so off-topic that no one, like, even, like, fans of uh, Pokemon won't have a preconceived notion going into I think movie. I think so. I think that is probably the smart play as well, because if you look back at the Resident Evil movies, they're successful, surprisingly so, uh, because they deviate from the game so much. Like, enough of the stuff is still there, but you're not re-watching the game but as a movie. You're watching something else within the world of that game in a movie form. And I think that is what's working here mm. as a starting sure. point. And I think if you build off of that, you have a chance to really make an adaptation of the main thing, but you've got to prove you can make the world and the characters of that world before you can dive into the actual right. story everyone's familiar with. And definitely the broad audience is going to be more open to origin stories of interesting characters, so it'll be interesting to see how uh, Detective Pikachu takes off. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, speaking of cautious optimism, let's talk about this week's movie. Uh, tonight, we're kicking off what we're going to be calling The Rage in the Cage. Volume okay. 1. There are dozens of Nicolas Cage movies to cover, and if we learned anything from our Ghibli Fest uh, series, it is not wise to blow your load all at once. <laughs> uh, so we'll be covering just five movies this year, and maybe we'll revisit this theme next year with five more Nick Cage movies. No promises, but we will look into it later. Uh, tonight's crazy ride for Rage in the Cage is Con Air, released in 1997, directed by Sam or Simon West, and written by Scott Rosenberg. The film earned a total of $224,012,000 at the box office, which is about three times what it cost. Not bad. Not bad. Uh, money well earned by our cast, which includes Dave Chappelle, uh, Steve Buscemi, Danny Trejo, John Cusack, Vane Rames, John Malkovich, Renoli Santiago, and the con with the style and hair, Nick Cage. Uh, MC Hammers. Gaines. MC Gaines is in it. There's so He's many the... names in this. It's ridiculous. Oh, it was this. Uh, I'm not going to start now, but let's get into this fucking movie. Let's go. Uh, before we do that, though, I have a couple of awards to mention. This movie did actually win a few, including the ASCAP Film and TV Music Award for Diane Warren's How Do I Live? Uh, favorite Supporting Actor to John Cusack. A BMI Film Music what? Award to Mark what? Mancina. A German Bogey Award for something, and then a Rassy <laughs> Award for Worst Reckless Disregard for Human Life and Public Property. Hey! Yeah. Why is that not a category of the Oscars? That's my favorite That's... award. It's so good. That's what you get for landing a plane in the middle of the Vegas Strip. <laughs> Absolutely. Not... Uh, there's so many things I want to get into. A mile and a half away from the uh, airport. Just saying. Just yep. saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just saying. Well, Ryan, speaking of the airplane, uh, what are some fun facts we have for this film? All right. Well, uh, fun facts. Uh, first off, since we were just talking about the airplane, uh, the real Con Air uses three different types of planes. This includes the Harker 800, the Boeing 737, and the Saab 2000. Now, the sight of the planes flying in low formation over the strip during filming caused the number of Las Vegans to call the police. This is very understandable. And kind of hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite funny. I, I love it. I 100% love it. Uh, now, next up on Fun Fact, John Malkovich was unhappy because the script was being rewritten virtually every day and he had no idea how his character was going to turn out. Also, John Cusack allegedly dislikes the film so much that he refuses to actually be interviewed about it. Poor guys. <laughs> Which is bullshit. Own up. Own up. I mean... This movie is fucking amazing. <laughs> this movie is amazing. And I will fight each and every one of you all night long about it. Bro, this movie is delightfully bad. This, oh. movie, is, this movie is so much fun, but it's it so has bad. Everything. <laughs> it has everything. This is the reason why we have Transformers. 
You know what I'm saying? Actually, it, no. I want to say The Rock is all we have Transformers, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, the last fun fact that I have for you guys is that Nicolas Cage actually traveled to Alabama for a short while to... You son of a bitch. I was perfect gonna... his accent. I was totally going to... I was hoping you were going to say that, but I found that out too, and I cannot believe that he researched this accent. Like, he tried. So he gets a sticker for trying. So oh looked, my god! So I've looked. So I've looked into it a bit, and Nick Cage is a very peculiar actor, which we'll come to realize over the next few weeks. Really? Um, so one of the things he likes to do is he has very unconventional met- methods of acting that he picked up from his studies of stuff like Kabuki, where he actually like over exaggerates on purpose because he wants to have a more memorable and more interesting take on a character versus just playing it straight. So, yeah, you get some fun stuff out of that. Yeah, I think the the original idea for this uh, for this series of films that we're doing um, actually came. Uh, GQ is doing a series of interviews with prominent actors as they broke down their most uh, their most memorable roles. And as soon as Aaron and I saw that they did one on Nicolas Cage, of course we both watched it and we both had a grand old time. But we're like, we really need to do some of these movies because there are a couple of on here that we've never even heard of. But the small clips that we've seen were just like, this is too ridiculous. We can't not see this movie. <laughs> yep, and, and like I said, we're only covering five this time around, but there, there's so many more. He's done so there many really movies, is. it's ridiculous. Oh, God. You, you could do this for years. Um, so initial thoughts, real quick. Um, I've what? seen a few scenes of this movie on TV, here and there, but uh, never the whole thing. So sitting down to watch this finally for once in one sitting... It's weird and corny at times, but I actually had a lot of fun with this. Like, it was a good time. I bet. I bet. Like, this movie, to me, comes... Like, it's one of those movies where you'd see it on TBS. It's like Armageddon. It's like... Uh, uh, several other movies I can't think of right offhand, but it was one of those TBS movies where when you click through the channels back in the day when cable was a thing, you know, you'd stop on it because you knew it was just so freaking entertaining and you could, like, just turn your brain off and just relax and just watch it because there's not much to it mm-hmm. intellectually <laughs> yeah yeah um i mean this this these these type of movies i mean they pretty much make the the basis of my childhood um i will say that this movie is delightfully fun but very bad <laughs> it's it's in, it's it's enjoyably bad. It's enjoyably just like really schlocky. I and disagree fun. with you, um, sir. This movie is complete. <laughs> uh, like, try to find potholes in it. I dare you. <laughs> we'll get to that. Well, we'll, we'll get uh, to that. But I will. I will say. I will say of the uh, of the uh, Michael Bay movies and the, the Nicolas Cage movies like that make up my childhood. I will say this is my least favorite. I still have a lot of fun with it, but it's definitely my least favorite. So yeah. Well, uh, if we're looking for plot holes, let's look no further than our synopsis. Are you boys ready for this? Yes. <clears throat> yep. I had a lot of fun with this one too. Here we go. Cameron Poe, decorated military man, returns home to see his wife treated like crap by local rednecks. He kills one of them by accident. But they totally started it. But Alabama laws apparently have loose definitions of manslaughter and deadly weapons. So Poe is sent to prison for 7 to 10 years. Meanwhile, college athletes raping drunk girls uh, only get 6 months. So fuck you. Moving on to the montage of Poe getting letters from his family and his daughter we've never seen. or he's That's seen. plot hole number one, Bo. <laughs> That's plot hole number one. It's in the fucking prologue. I'm sorry. Continue, please. No. no. <laughs> continue. Not, let him get through it. Let him get through it. There's some math involved in this, boys. Eight, eight years pass, and he's finally given parole. So he and his cellmate book a trip on the Con Air to a uh, flight, which is based on an actual program to transfer prisoners across large distances. Fun fact. Uh, look it up. But, like the Avengers Endgame, everyone is here. Cyrus the Virus, Diamond Dog, Joker from Persona, Thanos, <laughs> and some pedophile-looking motherfucker by the end of this whole mess. As you can expect, these cr- main criminals take over the plane with the intent of escaping after a transfer in Carson City to pick up the rest of their crew. 
Post stop was Carson City, but he elects to stay because he's got a friend who's a diabetic and he needs some help. <laughs> Meanwhile, government agencies are basically sandbagging each other to get this plane and the convicts under control. Uh, everything they seem to, uh, to do fails or blows up back in their face. Then one played by John Cusack makes the con uh, contact with Poe. They don't trust each other, but they agree Cyrus and his gain are fucking crazy. When they are trying to get uh, the new plane rolling in an, air at, uh, in an airfield at Lerner, uh, the Fed finally find them, and while members of the gang betray each other, uh, so they're forced to take off on an early flight. Cyrus roots, uh, roots out uh, Poe's lack of loyalty to, to his cause, and fighting happens. Poe manages to take control of the plane and forces it down before it's shot down. They land on the Vegas Strip. Poe reunites with his family for a bit, but Cyrus and D-Dog are on the loose. A uh, car chase happens, explosions soon follow, and both Cyrus and D-Dog are dead, or basically dead. They go through a lot of hell, uh, they go through a hell of a lot of shit. Either way, Poe finally gets to be with his family in the end. Oh, and that pedophile-looking guy gets to hang out at the craps table. Oh boy. I hate me, Neil. <laughs> well, you got this all wrong, man. Oh boy, here we go. The, the character you're speaking of had the biggest evolution uh, of all characters in the movie. Like, it, it, uh, Steve Buscemi's character is the only one who evolved as a character in the sense that he was the only person. He was supposed to kill that little girl. They paint this horrible picture, and he walks away. Why? Because he learned. He learned. He learned. He said he learned, man. He said he learned. That was his opportunity. And she was waving goodbye, meaning she was into it. No matter what happened, she was into it. Oh, Jesus Christ. That could be oh, taken no. so many wrong ways. I don't, know, I don't know how to respond oh, to that. Oh, no. <laughs> well, obviously, anything happened was consensual. <laughs> Good Lord. God, heaven. <laughs> uh. Like, I, 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 I love Steve Buscemi. I 100% love him. Anything he shows up in, I'm all, I'm all here for it. But that was just fucking grody. That was just so, that was just so gross. So I listened to another so podcast like, no, recently, please. and like they, they, they introduce his they introduce his character, and like just with the introduction yeah. and how he carries himself, he's fucking creepy. You don't need to sell it anymore. And then they're like, oh, and he wanders off. Oh, and he finds a little girl. I find oh, and they drink no. tea. I'm like, guys, y'all are Beautiful. playing it too close. Stop uh, this. They build they build it up, and what I love about it is they. Make him look like Hannibal Lecter, and he's this huge. And you don't really see who it is at first, you know what I mean? And you think he's the most worst person. Like, you know, actually, what I was thinking, I was like, he was going across, and they had like little guns and whatnot. It was Jurassic Park. That was clearly Jurassic <laughs> he's Park. A, he's, a, he's a velociraptor. He's a velociraptor. That's exactly how you treated him. Shoot! And, and then they take everything off, and then you see him. It's Steve Buscemi. And you're like, you know when you know, like you said, uh, Ryan, like growing up with these movies, you know Steve Buscemi's work at this point, and you're like, oh my god, I love this guy, and so I thought it was this beautiful depiction of this contrast characters of a lovable guy who's actually a very dark personality, and they see this evolution of a character seeing this little girl and choosing. To, we don't know what happens, but nothing happened was bad. There no violence. <laughs> she. Was waving him goodbye. I thought it was a beautiful oh character. God. Oh my just God. Just saying. Just I feel, saying. I feel like it was just played for laughs more than anything. I wasn't sure what to take from that one. I honestly feel like that little that little girl's inclusion was just to key up the tension and uncertainty for uh, for the audience. And beautiful done, Michael Bay. I'm, I applaud you, sir. Or Simon <laughs> West because he did direct. I am very curious why they need to t ramp up the tension d for him with that, though, because there was already a lot of tension going on with the main plot as it was. Here's another question for you boys, and uh, not to say this is a plot hole, but so here's this, like, abandoned airstrip, right? Mm -hmm. Was there not a lot of commotion that happened before the airplane takes off, right? How come yeah. no, no one in this trailer park is looking out their doors to see what the hell is going on? I mean, I feel, like that might, I feel like that might be just an issue of they didn't want to hire extras to do that bit. But, I mean, mm -hmm. realistically speaking... Oh, and, not, and not to, not to talk... That's to because that. it's a plot hole! I'm sorry. I Who the I hell was that? We're, we're like jumping that? way far ahead. We need to go 
way back to the point to where uh, he does go to prison. He is a dangerous weapon, and he has to <laughs> serve manslaughter. Well, yeah, he's a dangerous weapon. So I looked, oh, it, up, the... I looked it up, actually. I looked it up. I looked it up. Because as soon as they made that sentence, I'm like, okay, this is a conversation point that needs to be discussed. So I looked it up, and everything I've looked up uh, agrees with the same thing. That is that the sentencing was not legitimate. <laughs> yeah, it, like like uh, like now now if he wasn't white, I could have seen it. No, I, no. If, if he, he wasn't white like, in Alabama in that time period, and he just a, killed a dude, sure, he's going to prison. If but, you're a judge and you see his credentials and you look in those icy blue eyes that Nick Cage has, <laughs> you know that this man needs to be locked away. Because he's no, a, no, he's a no. Highly, de- highly decorated with, army ranger. With witnesses. A bunch of medals, a bunch of medals to his name, character witnesses, eyewitness testimony from his wife and from the other patrons in the bar that these dudes were harassing them. And then he find, he defends his wife and accidentally kills one in self-defense. Bruh, a public defender can get you off of this case. <laughs> Super easy. Yeah, he walked away with 10 years. Come on, guy. Come I, on. I get it. And based on his accent, because it was so good, the judges would be like, oh, he's obviously white bread Alabama American. <laughs> That's deadly weapon. That's deadly weapon. Nah, we gotta, we gotta put that man in prison. He's, he's a menace to society. Side note: Do you like how even in the Michael Bay movie, a woman who's six months pregnant is completely six packed? Yep. <laughs> I mean, you gotta but, keep, you gotta keep it, you know, hot for the kids. Oh my god! Yep. So like watching it though, like you, because I haven't rewatched these movies in quite a long time, and he is using the same techniques that he. Voiceover expedition or expedition. God damn it! I froze right before every you know, time. Every time, but you know, there's always uh, there's always the voiceover that like really explains the story, and like we'll see in the rock later on, like how this is an example later. But uh, uh, it's just it's so crazy how like you can just see how much of the Michael Bay movie and how much he really hasn't changed in his directing style or producing style rather yeah i mean you can you can like, it's definitely it's definitely hallmark uh michael bay like 100 percent. and but, i fucking loved it i thought it was great i mean it's really it's really cool and nostalgic i wish he would do something different in 2019 but you know he's getting it's nice paid right here and right there He's getting paid. He's like, why, why? If it ain't broke, don't fix. Let's yeah, like that. That's pretty much what he's just like. You know what? I know what 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 a massive amount of people enjoy. So we're just gonna go ahead and and do that and and have this movie make millions of dollars, and that'll be the thing. I mean, this isn't as bad as some of this director's other stuff. Like, it's still better than Tomb Raider. <laughs> still better than Expendables. I still haven't seen the Expendables. Wait, did he just do Expendables too? Let me double check here real quick. <laughs> uh, he only did Expendables two. Okay, and, well, that's that's a thing. Anyway, back to the conversation here. Um, okay, okay. Um, if you were in Poe's shoes, okay, so we already talked about the legitimacy of the sentencing. So when Poe is on the sh- on the plane, he gives up his freedom to save his buddy, or be there to help save his buddy. If you were in Poe's shoes. Would you have given up your freedom to save his life in that threatening situation? We teach him that God exists. Don't you remember? <laughs> yeah, I have to like like Bu- Bubba Gump or Bubba, you know, Bubba Blue, whatever his name was. Yeah, was, was I the only one that felt like this was just a very uh, like uh, an explosion laden uh, remake of Forrest Gump? <laughs> Dude, scene for scene. Scene for fucking scene. <laughs> that part where he's dying in his arms, that is literally like uh, Forrest Gump. It needs, more, it, it needs more flashbacks and cameos of JFK. Oh yeah, that's God. fair. And what was great is, is as he leaves, his, uh, Dick Cage's exit line is, I'm going to show you that God exists. And it's like, what are you talking about? And what was in the box? Remember when he goes through all the su- supplies? Do you remember what was in the first aid kit? Onions uh, and chicken feet. 
What? I mean, I mean and chicken feet. I mean, it's Alabama. I'm I'm not surprised. <laughs> oh, God. So you're saying like voodoo is so like prevalent in the uh, uh, p- penal system that even voodoo is used for like their first aid kits. Oh yeah, I mean, I think it's under the Article Thirteen. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it starts with the uh, it start, the line is uh, "You remind me of the babe." And it goes on from oh, there until yeah. it's the uh, power of voodoo. <laughs> no way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the whole situation was weird with the whole insulin needle thing. Because at first I'm like, oh, okay, it's just going to be a throwaway line at first just because they're going to give this guy a problem later. But like, they went on with that insulin problem for like the entire thing. I was surprised how long they rode that, that, that horse for. Yeah, that dude was dying of like eight different causes. Like wow. his, his his death was like etched in stone. Like ever since he showed up on screen, I'm like, yeah, it is de- not making it. It has been decreed by the gods that this man will die, and uh, Nick Cage can do nothing. Just watch. well, like if you look at it, is the only thing that humanized um, Nick Cage's character. Like, granted, he was going back to see his daughter, but he was a fucking asshole as a prisoner. If you remember the introduction, as they like gave everyone's uh, um, bio, like this Cyrus the virus, this is so and so, Johnny twenty three, you know, rape twenty three women, blah blah blah. Which I'll be getting that character later because that <laughs> shit was fucked up. Um, and they they get to um, Poe and they're like, oh, he's a nobody, he's a nobody. But still, he was a dick. He was picking fights with all the other uh, inmates. Like, he was there just to go home. He had an easy job. He could have taken it easy. But he just was sitting there, like, being an asshole the whole fucking time. I mean, <laughs> it's not like it's out of his character, though. I mean, it makes sense because he was wrongfully imprisoned and everyone around him is literally a killer, a rapist, a gang leader. So, I mean, I kind of understand why he's on edge and wanting to, like, just make everyone keep arm's length away from him. Right. Remember, right before he fought, uh, fought the dudes that he killed... What did Monica Potter say at six months pregnant with no belly showing? Uh, what did she say to him? You're not this guy anymore. You're not him anymore. So it goes to show you that this dude has a violent past. That's fair. That's fair. All right. No, I, I, right. I, I give you that. Yeah, because I'm going to annihilate every plot hole in this movie. Bring it. Let's go. I wouldn't call it a plot hole. I, I, I was fine with him being being the way he was. It made sense to me. Right. Like, I, I wouldn't say, like, so I, perhaps my, my earlier claim was a little facetious. It, it's not that this movie is laden with plot holes. The, the movie does, in and of itself, make sense, except for the bullshit-ass sentencing that he gets at the very beginning of the movie. Pretty much setting off the premise, but... Right. Let's think about it. Hold on. Oh, We're God. breaking this down. Go. So if the judge knows him, he they knows that he went to the army. Yeah, uh, they know everything about him. He is a deadly weapon. He has a history based on what she said there. You don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. So everyone knows. So maybe this is his third strike. Like m- maybe huh. that's a plot hole. We didn't have enough of an origin story of Cameron Poe or he becomes. But at the end of the day, we do have evidence that he has a violent past. Therefore making sense to why he was sentenced so hard. Plot hole, boom. That, that's Cross a possibility. Up. However, if, if that, if if that was... If the had brought that up, like, at any point during the sentencing... Yes, it was a long-ass movie. On. That, that got lost in editing. And we <laughs> only uh, about, come on! That was an editing mistake, like, so we can't... That has nothing to do with storyline and production, okay? Should I mean, you? it does. It does, but... <laughs> <laughs> I know I just put my shoe, put my mouth on that one, but like, yeah, let's. It's a side tangent. We're not here to talk about that. <laughs> it's an editing error, Ryan. Just like when they put Martha in in Batman vs Superman, it was an editing error. They should have cut that out. Exactly. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, that's not the crux of the whole fucking movie. Of course not. <laughs> I'm glad Aaron has my back. In, in a very sarcastic way, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sarcastic. It's a half truth, so I'll take it. It's all good. <laughs> Uh, what else here? Okay, do you think the accent works for Nick Cage in this movie? Why or why not? Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> it works only in the sense 
of how ridiculous the rest of the movie for <laughs> like is. Like it it fits in the overall symphony of nonsense that is Con Air. And it, it makes it makes it fun. It makes it a lot of fun. And you can tell Nick Cage is having a blast with it and is really like actually trying. Is it good? No, it really isn't. But it absolutely fits the tone that the movie is going for. So I'm not mad at it. I just laugh at how bad it is. I disagree with you 100%. <laughs> I'm saying, like, this movie works. Like, we're on I mean, the, it works. I, I won't, I won't tell the, you it doesn't we're, work. We're coming off of, like, Top Gun. This is, like, in a movie... This is a point when movie making was at its finest, when it was most coke field. Like, Don Simpson, which... Uh, we could do a whole sidebar about Don Simpson's influence on action movies because he was basically uh, Michael Bay's partner, Jerry Bockheimer's partner, and they had coke-fueled moments of writing this script. Like The reason why it changed day-to-day -day is because they were so loaded that they were changing it day-to-day -day because they were so coked out that they were just going up with these crazy ideas and they had so much money backing them up that they could pull it off and I truly believe they pulled it off in a crazy sort of way time and time again with every movie that they made because I love them dearly <laughs> I know what you're talking about uh, Ryan because these are movies you grew up with you know so like, yeah. like these movies were great and then when you find the backstory about it like yeah it's a little dark and it's a little bit like morally wrong to root these movies on but at the end of the day that is you know inspired a whole generation of great bullshit action movies I will say that I did appreciate this action That's movie right. more it's than the, 90s more it's than 90s the... action bullshit at its finest it yeah. really is I'll say I appreciate this action movie more than, say, older ones from back in, like, the, like, 80s or 70s. I'm not saying they're bad, but I think this one, to me, is... It it it, it, it and Die Hard, other movies of, like, the late 80s, early 90s, they're, they're a little more my speed, I think. I think, I think this kind of fits in, in what I'm more interested in when it comes to action movies, which is something a little sillier and not so much, like, focused on the machismo of the main character, like, back when you had Stallone and Schwarzenegger as the main characters... But that's just my personal preference. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think what it was is like Stallone and uh, Stallone and Schwarzenegger, they're one dimensional characters. They don't have like acting chops, so to speak. Like they have the same they're the Jeff Goldbrum, so to speak, like where they're character actors. But like Nick Cage, as horrible as an actor we can argue on a side podcast, he's still like acts the shit out of a role. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, John McLean, Bruce Willis, like, they really bring a certain difference. Well, I guess that's not true for um, Bruce Willis because he's pretty much the same every time. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know what I'm saying? With, like, Nick Cage, he, like, brings a different level of extremism to his characters that, like, you have to re respect. Like, he lifted this character in this movie to a realm to where they made two hundred plus million dollars. When this movie should have done shit, man. That's fair. That's fair. Um, so next question I got here for you is: Do you feel the convicts were portrayed well, or do you feel they were over the top? Why or why not? <laughs> well, oh, let, let's just go one at a time. Who who wants to take on these guys first? Ryan, go ahead, sir. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, my mine's pretty mine's pretty straightforward. I think all of I think all of them are really really fun caricatures of people. Um, but like, except for and I I wanna I wanna tip my hat to John Malkovich, who just is like at the peak of John Malkovich level, just like, oh. just like ridiculousness. I, I absolutely love Cyrus totally the agree. Virus. I, mean, I like, totally agree. Everybody else, like, yes, they were out there and they were ridiculous, and you could tell they were all just kind of having a blast and having fun with it, but, like, like Cyrus actually feels, like, ridiculous, but also has a character. 
Like, like he actually is actually kind of like a more complete representation of a person that's insane and like mega, uh, mega, megalomaniacal. Fuck, I, that's a hard word. This is insane. This is insane. God damn it! But I loved his character. Everybody else, they were fun and bad. I agree with you one hundred percent. Like, I was in that era. Like, I was seventeen when this movie came out. Like, I was heavy in like mall rats and these like new age indie movies, kids and. Rec Room from a Dream, so I was like the hipster, you know, nerd kid of, like, underground movies. And so, like, John Malkovich had this, like, cult following going into this movie, and even watching it, or if you even seen uh, Being John Malkovich, like, which is a great movie, yep. but, like, this movie arguably is one of his best acted roles of all time. Like, he displayed such, like, depth and character, and he brought life to, like, this movie was supposed to suck. This movie was supposed to be horrible. And if it wasn't for John Cusack, Nick Cage, oddly, his bad acting, but John Malkovich really carried, like, this certain level of, like, intrigue to this character of Cyrus the Virus, who uh, was batshit crazy, uh, and then somehow initiates this huge, like, overcoming of a plane... It, man and being a big fan of his work at the time even though the movie is shitty like the dude crushed it um i'm just looking at the list of actors and characters here real quick i wanted to see who they all were so i could kind of get a name to a face and everything um so pinball dave Chappelle. um i like him i think he was kind of he was he was annoyingly energetic but it worked for his character it did um mc ganius swamp thing he was just kind of generic. I mean, he did what he needed to do and was there. I was fine He's with him. Great. Um, jumping up to Billy Bedlam, played by Nick Chinland. Uh, he was okay. I think that um, he definitely was a good foil he's for good. Nick Cage's he, character. He, he played... Yeah, he does. I liked him. He played a side character in so many different, like, side movies. Like, I can't even name how many, like, late-night stars movies I've watched with him and MC Game in it and so like watching this movie back now like watching all these other ones like I've seen so many of these guys' work it, it was just mind boggling um, I've got uh, Sally Can't Dance played by Rinaldi Santiago <laughs> I didn't get this character at first because I, when I was watching it I was like looking away for like two seconds I came back and they're suddenly there and there's like this character who's cross dressed and everything I'm like I'm not against this character existing, but where the hell did you come from? <laughs> like, it was just so out of left well, field for me when I was watching this thing. I think in the reality of, like, prison, if you, you know, if you've seen the documentaries about, like, real prison life and, like, you know, look at Oz, like, back then, especially, like, uh, in the 90s, there was always these, like, you know, transgender, like, th this is a reality to, like, the prison system. So I think this is like a very tongue-in-cheek sort of like caricature. They're related back to like prisoners and like people in the penal system that oddly have gotten out, wanted to relate to the movie somehow maybe. But I think this is like a real character in prison that you would see. The weird part is when they drop down to Carson City, that's the first thing that he or you know, she says is like, I'm going to look for a dress in this dusty-ass like town. So does he or she steal that dress? Or how does she obtain that dress? That was like a side note that I really wanted to like get into. Ah, yes, yeah, another plot hole, you might say. Uh, I would say a plot hole, but more or less like a side like <laughs> plot line that we should be able to follow and evaluate. Like, That's fair. That's adding, fair. Adding more depth to the movie and making it that much more great as it was as I was saying when we start, first start, started talking about this movie. Um, I have three more here. Uh, we have Johnny23, who, I'll say, I think he portrays a, or Danny Trejo play, portrays a rapist character in a way that kind of works for a film, but for me, it still is kind of skeevy and gross and not really my thing. I, well, I mean, he's supposed to be skeevy and gross. Yeah, but I feel right. like it's skeevy and gross in the wrong way, where, where it's like, it's kind of played off a somewhat comical, I guess is the way to put it, like, not... Come not well, I don't think, but like it's played in a way where it's supposed to be a character you kind of laugh at a little bit. And it's like, 
Uh, no, I, I can't. I can't get, uh, get on board with this. No way. Mm. I like his name was supposed to be Johnny Six Hundred. Like that, like just puts a pit in your stomach. Like, ooh. But I feel like but, that's not so much a a actual like number he's achieved. It more just like, oh hey, I'm so good, I can get six hundred. <laughs> like no. Oh, he, he says in the movie because I've seen this a million times. They should have called me Johnny Six Hundred. And then uh, Cyrus the Virus says, well, it just doesn't have the same ring. But when he goes back to the scene where he has the prison guard, he goes, now they're going to call me Johnny 24. So, like, yeah, it lays, like, this super creepiness. But, like, I mean, it also adds up to, like, this payoff to where when they go through the wreck and they move his body and then they separate, take his arms separate from it. So, like, as dark as they make this character that he possibly raped 600 women, which is disgusting, at the end of the day, he gets his arms lopped off, like, in a bad landing. So, it's a big payoff, I think, at the end. Maybe, maybe. R- Ryan, where do you land on this one? I mean, I feel like the movie inherently, like, lean towards the skeevy edge of a lot of the convicts because as fun as the characters are supposed to be, they're supposed to be, like, these are the fucking bad guys. These are really skeevy-ass people. It's why I still stick to my guns that the little girl scene was there solely to make the the movie goers as uncomfortable as possible with Steve, with Steve Buscemi's character. So I think it that was, was intentional. That was the whole movie. I think it was intent. No, 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 no. It's like like that. Okay, we'll get to that character later. Um, Johnny Twenty Three. I like his character as an established villain. I don't think he has like a huge, like a a, a well rounded character. I think they definitely just play in into stereotypes and the fact that he's a gross fucking rapist that deserves to die. So they lean hard into that and then when he gets his comeuppance then everything is funky dory. So I think it's I think it was intentional that they made him skeevy as fuck. Yeah, yeah. Um hitting up oh, Vane Rings yeah. here real quick, uh Diamond Dog. Um <laughs> I like Oh this. my god, the mo- oh oh my god, I totally forgot about that point. I, w- I don't have my notes in front of me. I have so many notes for this. Oh is so many. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so pissed that I forgot about this. This is the most racist movie of all time. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Take the floor. What do you oh, got? Oh, dude, oh, I wish we could play clips so we could all like watch the part where they intro the part of Diamond Dog. He was a black activist. And the only reason why he... They never explain his crime. The only reason why he was in prison was basically because he is motivating the black community to be better than themselves. I don't, I, I, don't, I feel like I may, the, 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 I may be misremembering, but I think it might actually be like he was doing like, uh, I don't, I don't want to say like local terrorism, but probably something along the lines of like gain, like leading gains or gain violence. I think that yeah. was the implication. No, I, he, I, like, watched it was... scene, I watched the scene many times. There's nothing, because I wanted to be crisp on this. Like, there's nothing that suggests that he was a vigilante. There's nothing that suggests that he was, like, did anything violent. He moved the people. He motivated the uh, the black community to be something better based on what he accomplished. And so, like, it's like, um, oh, man, now I'm, told, I'm getting too excited. I can't remember the taglines. But, like, uh, uh, even John Cusack's character says, quote, blah, blah, blah. I hear someone type in the background. Someone looking this up. I'm looking up some details. Yeah, look up what Di- the Diamond Dog speech, but it is fucked up why he's in prison. Because it has nothing to do with, like, being a criminal or anything like that. Yeah, but es- essentially when you when you see his actions around all of the other inmates and the fact that he's willfully going along and just murdering a uh, prison guard Excuse so me. that he can like like look I'm not I'm not gonna who I'm did he gonna... murder who did he murder okay 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 hang on, hang on. he murdered a couple of the guards hang on, hang on, he like one dude's jugular with the with the handcuff so oh, so, so I'm looking at fandom fandom wiki which bring breaks in all the details of the character and everything 
Ahem. So, according to this first paragraph here, Nathan Jones, a.k.a. Diamond Duck, is a secondary antagonist to the film Con Air. He is one of the convicts involved in the hijacking the plane, the jailbird. He is an ex-military black supremacist leader convicted of multiple murders. Diamond Dog is portrayed by Vane Rames. So he does have multiple murders under his belt. Uh, no, there's there's it, no more detail than that. Uh, it goes into the plot of the movie, so it doesn't give yeah, any more background. Falsely accused black man in America. Yeah, no. did he commit those murders? Did he commit those murders? Was yeah. He just, uh, oh, wait, wait, here, here we go. Here's more details. Here's more details. Here's more details. Uh, Diamond Dog was a general uh, in a black supremacist military group known as the Black Guerrillas. He was found guilty yep. of blowing up a meeting of the NRA members claiming they represented the basis negativity of the white race. Uh, during his incarceration, he wrote up a book, yada, yada, yada. So he he so he actually blew up a, uh, a, a National Rifle Association uh, location. He blew up a bunch of white... Oh my god, damn. Cool murder. Cool motive. Still murder. Yep. Still murder. <laughs> All right. I, I... I, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you on the racist part. Like, Bing Raymond's character was essentially a character of every militant black activist and then said, okay, and now he's a bad guy like everybody else thinks he would be. And even the line, uh, they're talking, like, he's got a book deal coming out. They're talking to Denzel about the movie. I'm like, Okay, Kai. Right. That was that's so... a little. That's a little far. Can you can you stop? Like, I, I that will, was like. I will say though that I like what I did like about his character was the one moment where he was actually like. Con so there's a moment where Nick Cage talks to him and tries to convince him to like you know turn on Cyrus because obviously you know he should be the quote unquote top dog. He should be in charge. I mean, yeah. He shouldn't be bossed around by this guy. I kind of like that dynamic, and I wish they'd leaned into it more. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> All right, well, last one on my list here uh, is Cyrus the Virus himself. Um, this ties into another question I have, actually, so I'll just jump into that now. Um, I I thought the character was fine, but then I found out who else was uh, listed as potential people to portray him Uh and I found out Willem Dafoe was one of the potential uh, choices for actors. Oh my god. And I gotta say, I think, regardless of John Malkovich being good or not, Willem Dafoe would be it would be a pretty interesting improvement. I fucking love Willem Dafoe, man. He would, he I would, don't know if he would be an improvement. Dude, he would be well, scary like, as I fuck. Mean, like, I, I, I love Willem Dafoe. I would 100% love Willem Dafoe. And I think he would bring a definitely a different characterization to him. I don't know if it would inherently be better, though, because John Malkovich knocked that one out the park. He, he mean, took the ball uh, and ran with it. I mean, John saying John Malkovich knocked us out of the park is saying he'd get in second place in the Special Olympics. Like, it wasn't hard <laughs> because the script was so... I mean, it was an awful movie at the end of the day, like, you know, <laughs> between me and you guys. Like, and we won't, we won't tell anyone listening. Is, we won't tell anyone. Right. It was still complete and everything. I loved everything about it. But at the end of the day, uh, but William Defoe, but think about 97 William Defoe. So you're watching this movie. We don't really know a whole lot about him except from Platoon. Some crazy parts. I think he would have been too extreme. He would have been too good for the movie. <laughs> you know, like, he would have brought such a level of crazy to the character it would have distracted how bad of an actor Nick Cage was in this movie. I don't know. I feel oh, like that combination is something I want to see more of, though. Yeah. Uh, it would have been great, though. Like, it would have been awesome. That would have been awesome seeing him in this movie. Like, it wouldn't be John Travolta-Nick Cage combo, but it would be a good, like, comp competition to that. Like, it would be fucking... The world has never seen its like again. <laughs> Actually, like, the universe would shut down. William Dafoe and Nick Cage in a movie... Actually, sounds pretty fucking epic. I'd be down for it, hardcore. Oh, <laughs> uh, um, well, I'm with you, Air. I would. All right, recast that. Let's let's jump Ooh. down real quick. Uh, so now, uh, I'm gonna jump down to this last question here because we're going in an hour here. Um, it is said yeah. that this film is where Nick Cage turned from being mostly indie films to doing more act action centric roles. Do you prefer Nick Cage's action roles or his dramatic roles more? And was this shift in focus good for his career? <laughs> I definitely think money-wise it's good for his career. He's probably made a lot of yeah. money from these, for sure. Uh, he also spent a 
ton of money on some dumb shit. So was that his de- <laughs> was his was his success his demise? Like like did it just feel the crazy that is Nick Cage? So the more money he got for these roles, feel more crazy crazy eccentric acting later on because I would argue that um, Con Air was actually the last great movie that where things really started taking a turn so I think like the success he had from this like really kind of fucked him up because he really saw like just some crazy roles after this point I don't know so I think I th- like if we're talking seriously about Nick Cage as an actor, I think he relishes the uh, I think he relishes the opportunity to really like go like balls deep into a role and just kind of like act the fuck out of it. And he had a lot of that freedom. He had a lot of freedom to do that in more indie roles, but he I think he met, he retained that level of commitment and that level of like personal freedom as an actor even as he transitioned to bigger roles so you you like more of the world got to see him after his breakout with with Con Air uh, and then uh, and the rock uh, and his like more like mainstream stuff but he still got to be like as silly and as crazy as he really kind of wanted to be because he was able to maintain that kind of star power status with those movies. So I definitely see it as an improvement because the environment around him changed, but he changed very little. He managed to keep that integrity to his version of the art. And I I applaud him for it. I think he's, like, a victim of, like, the Michael Jackson syndrome where he was crazy, and the more he did, the more the world just exploited that craziness. And, Maybe. And I, don't just, think it was, I don't think it's that extreme, though. Uh, no, there's definitely some extreme za- examples we can take it, but I think there's a little baseline of, like, where we found a crazy person that was just willing to put himself on the line, and he kept getting paid. Mm-hmm. Paid for it and paid for it. They kept feeding this animal. And it's not, like not he, an animal in the negative sense, yeah. but you get what I'm saying. And it's not like he stopped doing indie films. I mean, he did one last year, Mandy, which I saw, which is weird as fuck. But like, it's Nick Cage to the core, so he's still right. he's still sticking out his artistic uh, passions and whatnot. So I don't think he's like, abandoned is, who he was. Like, is he aware of like? He, he, I'm not saying he's a joke of Hollywood, but he's definitely like when you watch a Nick Cage. Expecting uh, a Heath Ledger Dark Knight performance, you know what I'm saying? Like you're expecting it to be very tongue in cheek and very over the top and crazy. And is it by his choice, or is it by his choice based on the fact that he's just fucking batshit crazy? I think there's a level of him aware, and I think he leans into just how crazy he can get. But I think certain directors know how to direct and manipulate it. Certain movies that he's done this in. Uh, that I've read about, see, heard podcasts about, and whatnot, such as uh, Bad Lieutenant, which we'll get to ne- in in a couple weeks, or um, uh, va- uh, k- uh, Vampire's Kiss. I heard about through podcast. Oh, he, he has amazing, he, he, amazingly uh, awful. He 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 plays these roles in such loony ways, but directors have a way of like directing them and and ruling them into a, cer- a certain point, and that's how they get what they. That's how they get the certain performance they want out of them. Sometimes he'll run wild. He's like Robin Williams occasionally, where he'll just let loose and go crazy. But the right director can definitely gear him to what they need him to do. I mean, if you really want to go down the rabbit hole, I mean, we're talking about Peggy Sue Got Married. Like, very crazy movie. And it, once again, it's a situation where uh, he actually has not aged one single day between Con Air and his first movie. He looks exactly the same. Like, his hairline was always receding. Like, he always just, like, old as dirt. But, like, uh, these are just, early on, were just very crazy roles. And I just think they found someone that they just had no fucks to give and just gave everything to a role. And they just kind of, like, let it roll with them. Well, and speaking of no fucks to give, let's go ahead and jump to our mailbag real quick. Uh, if you want to reach out to us on Tumblr, Twitter, or Facebook, you can leave comments there on our social media platforms. You can also reach out to us on our email. Ryan, what is that email? 
Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, sorry. That email is evaxation at gmail.com because I couldn't think of one on the fly. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. We can't, we can't all be winners. Um, <laughs> and Great course, segue, by the way, Aaron. Oh, I try. I try. <laughs> um, it's even better when you call it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's but, what we do here yep. on this podcast. Uh, you can also leave comments down below on you on on the YouTube platform and everything else. Um, th- let us know what you think about uh, Nick Cage's performances and uh, what you think about this film in particular. We'd love to hear you guys. Um, with that in mind, let's jump straight to our ranking. Again, we have platinum, gold, silver, uh, bronze, uh, stone, dirt, and shit, and all the colors in between. Gentlemen, mm. what are we going to rank this film? Good day. Uh, don't ask me this question. Are you going yeah. to get a platinum bill? <laughs> I mean, how are we ranking this, okay? So are we ranking this as, like, great 90s action movies uh, that are horribly cliche and pack everything that's entertaining? Then I rank this pretty high. If we rank this as, like, a classical masterpiece, then it's going to get ranked, well, I guess, pretty high, you know? <laughs> uh, all right, I'm a... Based on a scale of uh, Nick Cage movies, because we're getting to this theme, I'm going to put this at a gold status. I felt like, budget-wise, it returned what it needed to, which was cool. It won a uh, Grammy for Best Song. It was a great summer blockbuster. I've seen it many, many times. I'm entertained by it every time I watch it. Uh, Nick Cage's accent was fucking trash and awful and I've made fun of it since the first moment I've watched it and all in all very entertaining I'm going to give it a gold alright Ryan when you want to step in what do you get alright um, I'm not as keen on it like I mentioned like of his work this is one of my this is one of my least favorites but I haven't seen as many of his works as I'd like to and I have a feeling there are going to be some others that I really don't like so oh, yeah. it'll be much worse oh yeah there, there will be much worse so i mean honestly thinking about it like it is it is one of the movies that i grew up with um it is very entertaining like it, like time does not do it any favors definitely but like it's definitely entertaining um it has a pro plot <laughs> um and it's laughably bad I'm gonna go ahead and give it a silver because I know there are, that I know there are Nick Cage movies that I like more than this, um, that I think are just better designed or just the nostalgia sticks to it more for me. And I know there are gonna be some real bad ones coming down the line, so I won't hit this one too hard. And I'll just I'll give it a silver. Oh yeah, just wait. Um, I will go middle of the road and I will say bronze. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it's middle of the road for Nick Cage because I have seen better, I have seen worse, and I don't think it is in either of those spectrums. I think it's definitely middle of the road. It's inoffensive to to, to an extent. Um, what? Well, I, I mean, in terms of Nick Cage films, it's inoffensive. Oh, so. Um, really? Oh. But um, I don't think it's as compelling as some of his other works. Like I still think I loved. Um, I, well, we're not, I'm not going to get into ones I love more because I think there's one of them we're doing later this se- this season. But uh, there's there's a lot more that he's done that I'm really into, and this one is good. But it's not as good as the ones I'm super into. So I'm hoping that we'll see some other ones that really out sh- that that really shine because I think I think the next one we do is gonna really uh, kick it up a notch. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, yeah, very, very wide. I'm disappointed we didn't get more into uh, John C- Cusack's character. And then his, like, counterpart, I uh, can't remember his name, but, like, the dude kept making fun of him for being, like, a huge liberal pussy. I was, and... was going to get to that, but that, but I feel like we've gone so long already. Oh, this. my God. All of that. Like, and the fact, like, the tunnel, like, during Carson City is a whole nother hour of, like, discussion. Like, this movie needs to really get torn apart. Maybe and we'll revisit to... this in a year or two and, and, and do a part cool. two of this. <laughs> Uh, one thing I want to leave off with before we sign off and get distracted, um, the very first image that you have of John Cusack is what? Him in sandals and socks. Yeah. No oh boy. You just can't let that imagery go for the rest of the movie. Well, thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you after the credits. Bye.
Not my best, not my oh, best accent, <laughs> but, it, but it'll work. It'll work. I, I, I gave it a shot, like, before. and like it, it, like every fucking southern accent I attempt comes out like Cajun slash French. <laughs> which is funny because like, you couldn't do the Cajun French the other night. <laughs> that, which make it makes me fucking mad, man. <laughs> I just, damn it, I could have, I could, I should have just thought, well, do 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 southern, and it would have came out like. Oh. Well, now we know for next time. Now we know for next time. <laughs>